Splendid. So welcome to this session uh, about multi-generation. So just to be very clear, we are not talking of babies versus gray hair people. We are really talking about how many years you have been a Wikipedian. So that's the meaning of generation in that circumstances. So we wanted to raise the topic because we have been around for now 23 years. I have the, the joy of having been there around for 22 years now. So I think I'm really definitely first generation. And we wanted to raise the topic because in all that time, things have been changing a lot and there is a shift in generation. So that was part of the meaning. So we have been dividing the generation in four, in fact, yeah. because we felt that was what what's probably the most the best description of the things. So the first generation is basically from 2020, uh, 2001, so anyone who started participating back then, till roughly 2007, roughly. So I'd like to ask anyone, am I the only one here from that generation? We are two. <laughs> Definitions. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, some of you were not born, I know that. But <laughs> so there's, there's, it's not, ages. it's not an ages from Wikipedia perspective. So anyone confirm no one before 207? Yeah, you're not sure, you don't even remember, maybe around that time. So that's the first, gen wh when did you join? Two thousand and four. You, we, you are absolutely. And what about you? Twenty six. So we are three. So it's, it's a fairly good proportion. But do the math. Yeah, I was also three. See, we are four. That's amazing. <laughs> I really saw many people from the first generation around us. So that's the first. The second generation. R roughly 2007 to about 2010, 11, 12, mm, when the yeah. mo uh, movement, uh, and maybe a little bit later, when the movement was big, the platforms were large and kind of culturally diverse, uh, but we, we still had a lot of room to grow, right? The mm -hmm. movement was just finding itself. And then the next generation, which we're, we're adding, we added her just two minutes ago to the panel uh, <laughs> because we're missing our, we're, we're uh, Awasi in but, Bangladesh yeah. couldn't get his visa and we were going to try to bring him on online. But as you know, uh, Bangladesh is having quite a moment. Uh, the next generation is that group right before the pandemic, right? So I'm from about 2015, 2014, 2015 to uh, the 2020 uh, when we were a, a growing movement kind of flourishing in a new organizing generation. Mm -hmm. And then Bukola represents our newest generation of organizers. Yeah, so I joined in 2020 and fourth generation. So just in case, che checking, raise of hand for generation two. Oh my God, you're alone, Ayla. No, so, no, no, we already, we already said you were generation one. <laughs> Okay, two and three, so 2015, 2020, roughly. Yeah. We yeah. And what about the brand new ones? Oh, we're fairly equal in, in the end. Yeah. Very good. And what's happening as we go through the strategy process as a movement, we try to figure mm -hmm. out what do we do with all these threats going forward. We can learn something from other movements. So both the feminist networks and the climate communities have really focused on this concept of intergenerationality. What can the folks who've done the many things before pass on to the next generation while giving all the space for the newer generations to be authentic and create space for the older generations to innovate, right? How do we be that partnership? And so we put together these series of questions to kind of mm -hmm. elucidate some of that and put some history and culture on that. So we're gonna start with a quick, just like how we got started, uh, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna go into the questions. So as I was saying, I, I joined uh, in February, January or February 2002, so soon after the creation, in fact. And I started on the English Wikipedia, only one active at that time, 
And after a few months, the French started moving it. But when I started the French, there was no one. So it was really day one, day, day zero. And since then, I've done a lot of different things. Uh, I, I and, and my name just maybe Florence Devoir. <laughs> uh, it just, in particular for the new one who joined, because she's not mentioned. On. <laughs> um, I'm Alex. Uh, I, I vandalized a little bit in high school. Oh, uh, bef- <laughs> uh, I was one of those people. Uh, but it wasn't until 2008 that I found the movement. Uh, I first realized, like, hey, I can actually contribute on English Wikipedia. And then within a year, I was organizing meetups and doing negotiations with the Smithsonian, Whoa. actually, uh, because I was, I was looking for a movement. I wasn't just looking for a hobby online. And so that that mm. moment to like, I need to start organizing was what pulled me in. And that's why I've been here for Very forever. Quick. Okay. <laughs> I am Luisina from Wikimedia Argentina. And I found the movement in 2016 uh, when I was a teacher, a history teacher, and also a human rights researcher. And then I became the um, education and human rights manager at Wikimedia Argentina. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Vukola James. I'm from Nigeria. I joined the movement um, during the lockdown. Um, I joined when uh, the One Libor Ref campaign was ongoing. And after I introduced so many African Liberians uh, to One Libor Ref. So from then, I was able to join another series of mentorship program, uh, which lasted for about four months. And having completed that um, course, I discovered there was a need for more Liberians within my local community to understand how they can become relevant, especially because uh, most libraries were also trying to adapt to the new normal, and most people were not going to the library. So what are the new ways that libraries can become relevant? And that was how I implemented the first project, uh, Wiki Glam Awareness for Liberians in North Central Nigeria. And once I completed that, I had another opportunity to join another mentorship program, which was the Train the Trainer for Reading Wikipedia in the Classroom. I was the, one of the first uh, from West Africa to join that program. And it really did help me a lot because I learned a lot of skills, especially around uh, project management. And so far, I had had a series of other opportunities. And I, I think um, going into the movement through mentorship really helped me a lot. Uh, yeah, thank you. So it's your question. OK. Yeah, so we're, we're going to do an intergenerational yeah. panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? No? Oh, she, she forgot her question. I forgot the so. question. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask myself my question? So right, right here. Okay. <laughs> See, that's a what perfection of new generation. They use phone, but... <laughs> okay, so uh, I ended up organizing, like I said, based on... Ask Florence. <laughs> <laughs> What's the question? Ask Florence the question. Okay, I might ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so uh, question to you, Florence. Uh, could you describe how you ended up organizing and what you think is different about your experience uh, than the experience that you hear about from newer organizers that you've met? Yeah, so the, the first comment I might make with the short description they made of how I joined is that back in 2002, there was no movement. There was no notion of organizers and nobody knew about Wikipedia. So you wouldn't join through a program organized by AFLIA or whatever, and you wouldn't imagine making a career out of it. There was no chance, right? So I discovered it by chance because I'm, I play games. It was not even online at that time, it was just plain, and sometimes you go to forums of discussion and you cut off the internet very quickly because it's expensive. And then you go back, and there is this guy from Canada a Greenpeacer, so that was an activist. And that was very soon after the terrorist attacks on, on the towers. And we started discussing things, and in particular biosecurity issues. And at that time, all these topics were actually discussed by the US government. So everything you could find about biosecurity and biosafety was stuff issued by the US government. And at that time, I was in the street on strike because I didn't want the war to go over Iraq and so on. So I thought, hey, there might be a way to actually 
teach something to put stuff online which is not coming from the government. And he showed me that website. Nobody knew anything about it. It was just, a, as I was saying, there was no one in French. And maybe in English we were, I don't know, maybe 100 people. And he showed me and I wrote a little bit of something there. And the next day on Google, which at that time was not related to the people, the, the search I was doing was exactly giving the same answers for anyone, anyone. My little miserable text, I must say, was there already above the US government. And I was just, oh my God. So I stick there. But there was no movement, no organizer, just a bunch of guys. No rules, which was great. And my and of course I vandalized because at that time we we could also use IP, you know, shadowing things. So we did a lot of we had a lot of fun. That was a play, playground. We absolutely did not imagine it would become this. So that was more of a playground. And really my first memories were the freedom. The freedom, no one tracking us. We were doing pretty much what we wanted online. And we had to create everything from scratch. It was really empty. No rules, no whatsoever. And my, my biggest memory was that the, the organizing thing came really after three or four or five years even down the line. So this were my first thing. But why did I actually start doing things with the, at the international level, I would say? It's simply because very early on I thought the English-speaking people, they are the majority. Just to give you an example, Wikipedia at that time was the English version. The other linguistic version were not Wikipedias. They were the international Wikipedias. So there was the real one and the things on the side, right? We were not on the same server. Wikipedia, the real one, was on the server. And the other ones, they were on another server. We were not on the same software version. The English was on the software version, and the other ones were on an old version. So it was really a different world. And I said, this is not going to happen. And that was my beginning. Yeah. So maybe, oh, yeah, you could, you could continue asking maybe the next generation. OK, um, so similar question to Alex. Uh, what would you say? How would you describe how you ended up organizing and what you think is different about your experience? Yeah, so for me, um, I came in, there was Wikipedias, there was an international movement, uh, but we just started doing outreach. So Liam had uh, talked his way into the, the British Museum. Uh, and a couple professors were doing education outreach, and I was like a year into editing, uh, and I saw that the DC community had meetups. Well, what was this meetup thing? We should do something with that. I mean, Liam just went to a museum. Why don't we go to a museum in DC? That's easy, right? I showed up at the event. I was like 18 years old, 19 years old, and I was like, we're around all these museums. What are we doing about it? No, 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 we're going to have beer and pizza. <laughs> like, that's all we're going to do. Uh, and I was like, that doesn't work. And it just so happened that Richard Nipel, who's a first-generation organizer uh, in the U.S., was at that meetup because he was like, the D.C. community hasn't had a meetup in a while. What are they doing? And he was like, I know. You should meet my contact at the Smithsonian. Alex, you're the only person asking this question, like, how do we do outreach? And so for me, I was invited. Like, I was told, like, you can organize, but there was no playbook. There was zero playbook. And so uh, Aud and I, so many of you know Aud from uh, Wikimedia Deutschland developer community, ended up presenting to 20 communications executives at the Smithsonian <laughs> a couple weeks later about, <laughs> yeah, about how we should collaborate between the biggest museum in the world and the biggest encyclopedia that was just having a lot of problems. And so I was just told, like, you're going to do this. Like, there's no, there's no question and there's no playbook and there's no plan. Right. Um, and I think that's like that's really changed. And so I, I'm going to throw this back to the next generation organizers. Like when what allowed you to get started? 
uh, as an organizer, you know, like the movement's changed quite a bit since like the Florence version and the Alex version of organizing. Like, could you describe how that like transition to organizing happened for you? Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I started as an organizer because I am the uh, education and human rights manager of a chapter in Argentina, Wikimedia Argentina. So I start being an organizer of different projects and activities, designing these projects and activities, and particular working with teachers in schools and university and also in research institutions. So I almost I always been organizing things and I think that it was really important because and is continue being really important because I am in the bridge between people from the movement and people that are not from the movement and came to the our programs and came to the chapter and became volunteers through these multiple things that I organize in Argentina and also in collaboration with the region. So that was my experience. And, and so you didn't have any other version of the movement? No. Than organizing? I have my version of the movement because then after a lot of time, I made my PhD about the movement. But it's only by researching the movement that I know how the movement worked before. Yeah. And for Bukola, like, what was that transition into the organizing thing? Like what pulled you from, you know, oh, I took a training with Aflia yeah. to like, I have to be part of this thing. Okay, so uh, just like you said, there was no playbook. And I wouldn't say I really had opportunity to know what generations of uh, Wikimedians I was able to meet because it was also during the lockdown. I had to do a whole lot of learning myself and uh, most of the trainees we had during the one live one ref were just uh, for one hour, sometimes maximum two hours. And for someone that is just coming into the movement, I don't know what uh, core content policy <laughs> are. I just know that, okay, they said there's this citation horn tool uh, that you use and they show us how to do this. But then I just had to go on my own and have to do a whole lot of learning. And uh, I did um, edited, contributed to Wikipedia for about two years. And then uh, suddenly I just went on a meta page and I saw the rapid grants page. And I was trying to just navigate my way around it. Then I had to meet with uh, an undergraduate at, at, at the time. Uh, he was leading a fan club. So I met with him and he kind of put me through the process. Although he just shared resources with me, so it's left for me to read through all of these resources and try to walk my way through. And that was how I was able to host the first uh, Wikiglam awareness. So it was more about me Wikiglam. doing most of the work myself. And it was really very challenging because at some point, I almost gave up <laughs> because I, I remember meeting some Wikimedians and they were like, Buki, do you know how to respond to mails? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was really tough. Uh, and I felt like this is something that it's a challenge. And I, I wanted to prove him wrong that I can actually respond to mails. I, I can send back uh, messages. I can even create the grants. I just need you to share, give me like a step-by-step -step guide. So yeah, that was how I got into it. I trained the first 30 uh, librarians and uh, I was volunteering at a library as at that time. So the, uh, ad the administrative head of the library wanted uh, to also do more outreach. So we started thinking of other ways to involve a lot of people and that was how I then got access to the reading Wikipedia in the classroom, which was also very good. Yeah, so it was tough, but yeah. So to Florence, what things are you constantly teaching that the next generation still hasn't figured out? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> lots of repetition, like a teacher, you know, repetition all the time. Well, I first wanted to reflect that when we, I try to look at it very from high above, every generation had some biggest challenges, some very different challenges. So for my generation, the first challenge is that nobody knew us. Nobody. So the first thing is we want to do recruitment. We don't know where we are. We don't travel. We don't meet one another. How do we recruit? So yes, I spammed forums of discussion. Hey, 
you knew nothing about that flower, just come over, watch here. Of course, I was blocked each time. So there was a recruitment process. Of course, the, the second problem, when people starting talking about is the press, we were criticized like it was terrible. We were considered to be a cult. We were considered very badly. And far from coming to us, the librarians, they were just looking at us very, from very down. So who are those people? So our challenges were this one, and we could not connect to the others. And all of a sudden, around 26, roughly, the press started to realize we existed. So the press, the press went like crazy. And what happened, many people created an account. So we saw a surge of new people. And so our own challenge at that time was, how do we keep the light on, like servers? How do, how do we scale in terms of growth from a technical perspective, but also from the human perspective? You would not believe that right now, but if you see every day for one person, there are 20 new editors. What do you do? 20 new people, as if I come up Monday and all of you are new. Say hi, and you start doing things. The next day I come back, Tuesday, same number, new people. What do you do? That's panic, honestly. So we needed the tech people very much because there was vandalism. This was the moment where we put all those tools. Was there any training thing? Honestly, not. We were just trying to survive, right? So that's when we set up many of the really set in stone rules, such as citation, because we had many crises because of um, false data without any sources. And that's when we started slightly putting down things. But the only training we did was to say, hey, you want to know about neutrality of viewpoint? This is here. Hey, you want to know about sources? This is here. And just survive. No more than that. So we didn't actually suffer in terms of training others because we were just pointing them to the place. Yes? Yeah, just maybe to mirror this. Yeah. I meant on the other side yeah. of, of, the, of the game. If you can. need a mic. Oh, you, you need a mic for the, for the online people. One. Thank you. Uh, I just want to reflect that back, like from the other side, I think, of the game around 20, uh, 2005, 2006. Yeah. Uh, the newcomers experienced the community as much more bureaucratic, nasty, uh, bite the new newbies. You know, that's a, it's, the, it's the other side of the story. And I actually, I made my first edits around 2004, like, it was still, I, I was that generation who was still like this uh, yeah. very, very um, easygoing thing. We weren't required to yeah. add like references. Exactly. Or you had like the references just in one section in the end, you no, just the, listed the your sources. The, the obligation to cite sources came after the second teller big, big mess. Yeah, exactly. And because the guy was so happy to get in the press everywhere to just call his sad story. Uh -huh. So we had to really find a way to improve the situation. And that's when we increased simply the information on the wiki. That's also pretty early on when we created Meta, which did not exist at first. For at least a year, I was alone there with Brian Viber. We were the two <laughs> and one troll. We were three trying to pack things there. <laughs> Just <laughs> so there definitely nothing about uh, Grant or whatever. It was just I, trying to pass stuff. I, yeah. I don't want to throw too much to the audience because yeah. we want to so, keep. Yeah. <laughs> so now the problem is after a while, there are many people, but they actually do not read the fucking manual. <laughs> you know that expression? Do not read the fucking manual. Maybe yeah. not. Maybe she doesn't know. Yeah. Uh, RTFM. Uh, now they actually ask questions before reading. That's the problem with the new generation. They do not read. They come and say, could you do me a training about blah? And the next day, could you do me a training about blah? That's you are asking all the time. So what? I don't know. It just, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't fit. So I know there are some ex some things. So what am I tired about telling all the time? Things that have been around for 23 years. And it feels that there have been hundreds of wiki pages written and manual and wiki learn platform, blah, and people still continue asking to a person because we are human.
And I'm going to expand on that real quick, just to keep the panel going. Uh, in that, the the thing that I'm getting asked about a lot is like, where is the how-to manual? And I'm like, which of a hundred do you want, right? Like, we have so many how-to manuals, and no one is using any of them. And so I think the the thing that's really frustrating is we're we have the documentation, we have the story, but we're not necessarily giving it to folks and it and it's relying on a lot of like florence's and alex's to remember why we even created the manual to begin with which is not helpful right mm -hmm. um and so i want to throw it back to mm -hmm. to you all mm -hmm. like what still confuses you and what do you wish we actually taught you instead of you having to ask yeah so I would say um, something that confused me initially was like the complexity of the wiki project. Like uh, when you are coming in, you don't know where to start. There are, there's so many documentation with so many hyperlinks. You just keep clicking, clicking, clicking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think what would have been useful to me was having like uh, it could be a a repository, but let it let it have like a beginner's segment, a beginner's documentation that has videos that would now link me to how I can move from being a beginner to an intermediate. And then from an intermediate, I can then proceed to being an experienced editor. Uh, there's so many documentations, they are not properly uh, arranged or structured. So it becomes a lot, a lot of tax. Like not everybody has that uh, patience to walk through all of this documentation. And the frustration doesn't yeah. make sense. <laughs> yeah. You're looking at the older folks like, why are you frustrated with this? This makes no sense. Yeah. Uh, Lucina, I wonder for you, like, what what was like super confusing, or you still wish someone had like helped you with it? <laughs> okay. I think that that the to, when you are a newcomer, uh, the Wikimedia movement is con confused you. It's like, what is this? What is happening here? This is Wikipedia, Wikimedia, Wiki what? So our experience as, or my experience as an organizer is like, we need to understand what is the Wikimedia movement? What is behind the Wikipedia? And what is the background of Wikipedia to, under, uh, to understand what we want to do there, because if not, it's like another internet web page, and it's not the same. It's not what people need to know when they are beginning with Wikipedia. So in our experience, we design, I don't know, thousands and thousands of booklets, tutorials, video tutorials. My face is in YouTube all the time, teaching how to use Wikipedia, <laughs> so that is like my life. But I think that when people, or at least teachers, the academic world understand what is Wikipedia and what, what, is, what are the values that are behind Wikipedia in an internet safe place, but also a place that make conflicts and you have to be there to, to understand those conflicts and to give a context to the, those conflicts, People wants to be there, so I I think that is confused, but it's necessarily to be confused, and you are going to frustrate, be frustrating Wikipedia. It's part of the process. Sorry, just to add to that, I think another thing that was confusing was uh, once you've completed like a campaign, you don't know what next, you don't know how <laughs> to, you don't know what community to join. So I think for organizers, apart from aside from just organizing campaigns. Let uh, participants help them identify their interests, uh, expose them to other examples of projects or campaigns within the movement that they can join. Uh, for a librarian, you might want to join the Wiki Loves Monuments community or team. For a student who is interested in climate topic, you might want to join like uh, the Wiki Climate Campus campaign, or for someone who, ha who is passionate about sustainability, you might want to join the Wiki uh, sustainability community. So I think uh, organizers need to do more in terms of connecting uh, participants with other communities that would be relevant to their professional interests. Another thing is about the governance structure. Which can be very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. <laughs> for, no, no. Ex I, I'm saying this because uh, for most people who just come in as editors, they don't understand what uh, movements uh, yeah. MSG is. 
They don't know what the Global Council is. They don't know what the orb does, <laughs> right? So how would they, it's very difficult for them to connect with all of these things. So that's, I, I think we also need to do more. It's not just about onboarding people to join campaigns, but let them understand the governance structure. They should understand the various roles of people within the community. Thank you. So, so Florence and I were both laughing because we don't understand it. <laughs> and I, and I think this is, the, <laughs> this is one of those crazy secrets about movements right is yeah. that even if you've been around for forever it's just as confusing right? and it grows more and more confusing <laughs> one of the big problem is that when organizers leave they actually don't clean up behind them <laughs> wow what it, no they should right you go to a hotel, you clean afterwards. No, they don't. So things accumulate, and after a while, you don't know which wiki project are still active, which are inactive. Yeah. What is this confusing for a newcomer? What do you think? Are there other things? You have one more? Sorry. So I think the thing is not necessarily confusing. Yes, it is confusing, of course. The, the Wikiverse is like an entire like multiverse that Marvel hasn't tapped into yet. But um, <laughs> I think that the, the thing that was quite um, frustrating, I think, is exactly what Pecola said, is that there, there are all of these resources. They're just really hard to find. But as somebody who then starts as an organizer, you start collating those resources and literally it's moving at lightning speed. So by the time you've just, you know, very proudly presented your welcome to new Wikipedians kind of thing, it's all changed. Like now the suddenly there's visual editor or the so-and-so doesn't exist anymore or whatever, those things, that's no longer relevant. And so you're just like, ah, <laughs> no, now I've got to start all over again with a whole load of new things that I'm not even sure I know and whether it's going to stay or not or whether it's still going to be relevant by the time I've finished painting the, you know, San Francisco Bridge, you know, it's kind of like the whole thing. Oh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, Go on. Are, uh, did you want to add the comment on the... <laughs> yes, I, I, it's different because I, I was a newcomer in 2005. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I have the sensation that everything is a playground. Yeah. And it was like uh, the, the, the red link town, you know? Everything was red. So it's absolutely different than today when the things yeah. s seems very made. So that's the reason that I I don't left so the, the, the other projects like Wiki Voyage or Wiki News because that sensation is always there. <laughs> the red links and the lack of documentation and, and the spirit of the things that needs to do it. So I love that. So you're recreating the, new, the, the open space that we had the first few years by either moving some of the projects, such as we did for Wikiquote, other by Wikitravel, or local languages, such as the African languages. They enjoy the same freedom we had the first few years. Because everything is to be done. But what could we do otherwise for Anya, our fifth generation? Maybe you have, I don't know, I'm going I to ask you some ideas, but... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, something. We're, there's, coming, we have a generation <laughs> coming, coming, yeah. Okay, so something I think would be useful is um, that based on, based on the learnings I've gained over the years, I've always um, make it a point of call to identify the different categories of uh, participants that are joining a campaign. So for newbies uh, who want to join an existing campaign, the level at which you train them is different. So I create a list of resources and not just share these documents with them like they did for me, but hold like a series of uh, onboarding session and not just one session, but multiple sessions for them to better understand how they can contribute. And there are different levels of contributions that they can make. Unlike when I joined, when uh, they just tell you go and create an article, go and edit, and just f uh, find it yourself. So I try to explain to them the different kinds of activities that they can do. As a newbie, you don't expect someone to start creating article from scratch. 
And you don't expect someone who doesn't know how to contribute to a local or speak a local language to improve articles about that language. So for that kind of person, you might want to identify some very simple tasks like uh, uh, maybe just correcting gra uh, grammatical errors or uh, adding hyperlinks or uh, adding info boxes or just adding images because that's what you can do at that point. Uh, then for the other categories who are more advanced, then you might want to let them know that, okay, uh, you can contribute to this campaign by either translating or you don't, if you know you don't really understand the core content, please do not uh, create an article from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just stick to translating or uh, doing more tax uh, like that of the beginners. So I try to ensure that it is well uh, properly stated from the onset so they don't really find it difficult. And because I have experience navigating all of the documentation, I can also just direct them uh, strictly to what would help them. Right, so that's what has been useful. Now we have more documentation. We also have more videos to share on YouTube and even from past uh, trainings that we've had. So I think all of these things have really been helpful for uh, those fifth generations that are coming in. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and Lucina, uh, we'll, we'll do you next. But Lucina, what, what do you think we need to pay attention to for the next generation? Um, okay, well, I will give a pedagogical answer because it's my way of answering <laughs> but uh, the for me i think that it's important to to understand which are the issues that concern this new generation and in what way they are thinking being on internet because i think that perhaps we are like a little bit far away of of what they are thinking right now on how to be on internet and i think that wikipedia and wikimedia projects can offer I don't know, a terrible digital territory to be terrible in a good way, like a incredible. Uh, but we need to think in what way we can accompany and support them in the in that path because um I don't know, perhaps it's very confused for them how they can be in that place that look very vintage. So we need to be there. <laughs> I, I think one of the reasons I came in here, because I, I thought the term generational was a very interesting term, but the, the, the simple fact is, is you've got on either side. Um, yeah. uh, you've got the children, you know, who are, who are growing up, and then you've got people who are retiring. People who are 65 now were 45 when Wikipedia, or well, 45 20 years ago, and they were already at, you know, active. Um, and so integrating people like that who have a lot of free time now, and not not all whom want to travel, you know, and they they, they spend a lot of time at home, and it, it's it's and there's going to be. I, my my husband just told me, oh, I could upload pictures to comments. I'm like, you've known me for oh, <laughs> anyway. But um, new and and the other thing is me. I did not. I only made minor edits for probably ten years. Um, between uh, 2010, 2011, and then, um, and, I, and I became active on Wikipedia again in the last few years. And I have no idea what things are like now. I mean, the way I did things back in 2007 are not the same way that, that uh, um, although there's still some of the th same things that are going on. Then. Yeah. So, at some per yeah, it's a perfect point. So, so as an old one, how do, we, uh, how do you guys retain me? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, huh? we're not there yet, are we? Uh. <laughs> but but I, I think something that I'm loving about the movement we're building now is we're seeing a lot of people come back. And we're seeing a lot of people come back to a very different movement. And that very different movement is so excitingly, so many opportunities. I mean, like Wikidata and translation and comments and all these things have grown and become so much more expansive but at the same time, so much more overwhelming. Uh, and so I, I just, I wanna thank the panel. We got about 30 seconds left, but I, I think we should have these intergenerational conversations and we should be deliberate that it is intergenerational, right? We're not different, right? As, as Carrie was saying, some of the older generations are coming back. Some of the newer generations are teaching us things that we didn't know we needed to know, right? And that, that is the work, I think. Uh, so uh, I think we just hit the time. It's a perfect conclusion, I think. Yeah. 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 And I would say that we also need to 
think about uh, how our campaigns align with their interests and how it improves their uh, professional or their career growth. Uh, because we shouldn't just organize campaigns and put everybody there because like we all have different needs and interests. So we should always put that uh, whenever we are thinking of running campaigns. Thank you. And we need both of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, everyone. And let's continue the conversation to make sure to keep the old, the number one, two, three, four, and five. You have to remember the second <laughs> ten. I owe you. <laughs> I'm so glad I can't do it.